The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Sin City Monster Hunter Madness, The Old God Slain by Thilk, Independence Day Hardcovers Rain from the Sky, and a few trade paperbacks, plus Part 16 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, I'm joined by Bain publisher Tony Weisskopf for an Independence Day interview with Monster Hunter Legion author Larry Correa. We also have a debut of a song by Bain Slushmaster General Gray Reinhardt, The Monster Hunter Ballad. We think you'll really like that one. Larry Correa did. First, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. It's the beginning of another month, and that means new Bain books debut in the bookstores and at booksellers everywhere. Hooray! Hooray! The hardcovers and trade paperbacks, those uh, trade paperback or those hardcover size paperbacks, actually go on sale the first Tuesday of the month every month. And to make things more confusing, the mass market paperbacks go on sale the last Tuesday of the month prior to a book's official publication date. None of which matters as much as the fact that Captain Crunch is actually a commander and not a captain, according to the stripes on his jacket. My entire childhood has been a lie. And he's also a character on a cereal box. I'm so sorry to bring you both of those tidings. Details, details, anyway. Hey, the July hardcover is the new Honorverse Anthology Beginnings. Yep, this has stories by Timothy Zahn, Chuck Gannon, Joel Presby, and David Weber himself. It's the sixth volume of these tales that are set in the Honor Harrington universe, the Worlds of Honor. Also out is Sarah A. Hoyt's Noah's Boy. That's the third book in her Shifter series. By the way, we learned last podcast that Noah's boy is diner slang for a ham sandwich because... A ham, because Noah was a son of ham. Yep. And there's another original trade paperback this month. It's John Lambshead's contemporary fantasy Wolf in Shadow. Yeah, that one has monster hunters in London in it. It's really cool stuff. We will talk to John Lambshead in an upcoming podcast, by the way. Excellent. I'll be looking forward to it. And finally, we have an Omni edition called Leaden Universe Constellation, Volume 1. Laura, can you explain what an Omni is? Sure. An Omni trade paperback is a size between a trade paperback and a mass market. It's about 5 by 7 inches, and it's perfect size for packaging three or four novels all together in a single volume. What's in this one? This one is a collection of Leaden Universe short stories by Leon Miller. Kind of the roots of the Leaden universe. We're going to have the complete everything to do with Leaden out there when we're finished with this with Volume 2, which will come out later this year. Wow, a great selection of new science fiction and fantasy, and all of them are at your favorite bookseller now. Well, I have Bain publisher Tony Weisskopf with me here for the podcast, and we want to welcome Larry Correa to the Bain podcast. Hi, Larry. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Larry Correa is the creator of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times best-selling Monster Hunter series, as well as urban fantasy hard-boiled adventure saga The Grim Noir Chronicles, with a new entry coming out next month, Warbound, with Mike Kapari. He is the author of Military Adventure Deep Six and upcoming Swords of Exodus. And out now is the mass market paperback edition of the fourth book in the Monster Hunter series. This one is called Monster Hunter Legion. As many of you will know, Larry is also a self-professed gun guy. He was a firearms instructor and part owner in a gun business, and he recently wrote an article that got a lot of attention on the technical silliness and misinformed thinking behind recent government attempts to impose gun bans. Larry, I bring this up because the accuracy of the gun stuff in the Monster Hunter books and the attitudes of the Monster Hunter seems to come out of your long-term interest in real-life guns and gun culture. Tell us more about the characters also seem to come out of that culture. They're, these are not people who fall apart when faced with a supernatural threat, right? 
kind of what happened was when we when I started on the Monster Hunter uh, book, I, I I was a firearms instructor back then, and I was a huge gun nut and also a huge B movie nut. I love monster movies, and uh, one of the goals was I wanted to write uh, all the monster movie type stuff, but from the perspective of my people, uh, the people in my culture, because it's kind of a running joke. We watch monster movies, and you know most monster movies would be over in five minutes if uh, if it started gun nut. And it's like, oh, look, a terrifying monster, and then you just get a shotgun and blow it away and call it a day. So uh, I wanted to write Monster Hunter from the perspective of my people, you know, the, the heavily armed people who, you know, the hardest part of the zombie apocalypse is pretending you're not excited. <laughs> what? Did, did that actually... So, uh, yeah, it, it worked out really super good in that respect. That, that, that's, a, that's a telling point because um, I, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, of B-movies, and, uh, and I think one of the reasons is because I find them so ridiculous. And so when I was given a synopsis of the first Monster, Monster Hunter International book... And the, and the part of the description was talking about B movies. I I was really not very enthused about it because I thought it would fall prey to those sillinesses. But it's really an answer to those movies, and that I think is part of what makes it so much fun. Yeah, I embraced the silliness while still making it plausible for for people who uh, who love that kind of thing. Uh, one of the best compliments I got when it first came out was um, I had guys, you know, they're stationed over in Iraq in Afghanistan, and they're reading the book, and they're like, yeah, man, if monsters were real, this is totally how we'd hunt them. <laughs> if. I, I, like, I, yeah. yeah. I, I, I like exactly. That, I, like, I like that if, Larry. Yeah, if they're real. Uh-huh. <laughs> what, what is that statement? Well, I'm that, legally obligated yeah. to put that in. I see. It makes sense, yeah. What is that statement that uh, that I think you quoted it from a gun blog some somewhere? Um, and most people see zombies, they they think run, and I think here's a target rich environment or something like that. Yeah, it's the uh, actually I, I opened Monster Hunter International with that quote, and it's uh, let me think off the top of my head here. It's um, you know the difference between you know what the difference between me and you really is. You look out there and see a horde of evil brain eating zombies. I look out there and see a target rich environment. And uh, what it was is there was a there was a thread on uh, on the on the the firing line, uh, which is an internet gun forum called Lines I'd Like to Hear in a Horror Movie Someday, and it was a bunch of gun nuts cracking jokes about you know bad bad horror movie tropes. And uh, one of the guys put that line, uh, a guy named Dylan Freeman, and I laughed so hard. And at the time I was writing Monster Hunter, and that was just so cool. It really clicked, and. Uh, that wound up being the opening quote for the book. I mean, it just really, really, really clicked for the for the story. It's true. It's because when you when, part of the fun of the Monster Hunter universe is, and that's why it's not horror. It's more adventure than horror. Is you know, horror is all about the protagonist and their feeling of terror and dread and helplessness. And Monster Hunter, they're not really. I mean, they might temporarily feel terror and horror and dread, but then they get down to business. And. uh it's all about the protagonist finding ways to like kick butt and take names and overcome challenges and so I don't know I have a lot of fun with that. Well, I think your your monsters are really well done as well, and they're they're really creepy and and you and deep sort of in their uh, in their conception, like the uh, the Shacklefords, uh, the uh, the the in laws of our hero Owen. <laughs> Who are who happen to be vampires, <laughs> and uh, and the oh, old they're, one. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, but really, don't you don't you haven't you been too hard on them? Tell us why shouldn't Julie Shackelford just come to terms with her mother's differences in the name of diversity? I mean, are vampires <laughs> really that bad? Tell tell us something uh, about your Boston influence. Universe? Yes, <laughs> I see. I uh, where do these I'll vampires? Come I, from? I wanted to go. Well, there's such a that, that whole trend of, you know, the sparkly romantical vampire crap and romance vampires and sexy vampires. And, hey, I'm not knocking anybody. More power to you, whatever you enjoy. But I wanted to go back to the roots. I wanted to go back to, like, hardcore, scary, evil monsters. I mean, they don't want to date you. They want to kill you. And they want to eat you. And they're horrible. And if they're sexy, it's only kind of like lantern fish at the bottom of the ocean have little lanterns to attract fish so they can eat them. That's why vampires are sexy. So they can get you in and then kill you. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to get back to like horrific, awful monsters. 
I, I, I'm and, really, uh, I tried to do that with the vampires in Monster Hunter. I'm really glad you didn't say What's you were. I, I said I'm really glad you didn't say you were inspired by your your own in-laws. So yeah. No. Oh boy, believe me, I have ne- I have never heard the end of that from my mother-in-law and father-in-law. <laughs> with the <shackle. laughs> Well, you never. Do. Oh my gosh, I always I always get that. So, and they're staying with me right now too. They're visiting. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we we just figured this was your family. You were just doing a what do you call it, a Mary Sue, Peggy Sue, and uh, and, and writing your actual life. Is that not the case, Larry? Well, you know the, the thing about the Mary Sue is like the people who um, bring that up. They're always talking about like fan fiction. You know, I don't I don't really get the anti Mary Sue thing. If you write an entertaining story that people like, so what if the character is similar to the author? Because you know the people reading this, they don't know the author, and so as long as they're entertained and they're having a good time. And it's a good character, then I, you know, hey, I, I figure Mary Sue's have paid my paid my mortgage. Um, so yeah, you know, there's, there are some similarities between me and Owen, but he is a lot cooler than I am. He's like way, way cooler, and tougher, and smarter. Well, he's he's a really tough guy, and and but he's got a heart of gold in the book. Um, it, I, I want to ask you about a couple of the other monsters, particularly the elves and the gnomes. Uh, I like, you know, the first two books are set in Alabama, where I'm from, and um, it's really great to just have something set there that's not, you know, trash in the state. But, but uh, well, you're, you I love sort Alabama. of Alabama. You trashed it literally, you know. <laughs> but, um, so your elves are, are what my grandmother might call trashy people in a nice way, if she was saying it in a nice way. Um, <laughs> Were you and and your gnomes? They're they're like these uh, these gangsters in Inslee, which is a bad neighborhood in Birmingham, or or was uh, very bad. I don't know if it still is. I mean, they might have bulldozed it since I lived there. Yeah, well, it, parts actually, parts are, yes, parts are coming have, up. Yeah. Uh, but my uh, my college is over there in that neighborhood as well, and we we were. I often had to drive through there back in the day. So um, some of these takes seem like they might be a little satirical, uh, and and but. But they come off well in the books. Were you afraid when you were coming up with uh, with with your completely different opposite takes on elves and gnomes uh, that that it was going to get too funny? Yeah, I tell you, the the most editing I have ever done um, as far as changing stuff around was the gnomes, because the first time I wrote the gnomes, I had my alpha readers read it and it was too silly, and so I, I took it back and I made it a little less silly. Then I have to do it again. <laughs> Just take it down a little bit more. Um, it's kind of like that fine line because you know you're writing a book that's it's got a lot of humor in it, but it's still serious. But uh, so I, I keep introducing these twisted fantasy, uh, you know, twisted versions of well-known fantasy races, and so it, uh, it it's, it's a fine line to walk to not get too silly. Um, but yeah, the gnomes. The, the the scene with the gnomes is one of the, everybody's favorites. So it did actually work out really well. And I think how it finally worked out is I actually made them scary. I made them a little bit terrifying because they're straight-up gangsters, and they will they will murder you. And, yeah, I mean, they really kick, and, uh, kick Owen's ass, I mean. In the... <laughs> well, yeah, the fight scene, the, 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 that because this, this is a series filled with violence and action scenes. One of the best fight scenes ever is still Owen versus Ted Gnomes in a fist fight. <laughs> and it's so hilarious. Uh, the, like, the lead-up to the fight, you know, him, Owen's boss, Earl, is like, hey, you know, protect down there. And he's like, you know, like covering his crotch. And Owen's like, what? Oh, crap. <laughs> and then he's like, Earl, I can't hit them. They'll, like, explode. And he's like, oh, don't worry. They're tougher than they look. Just go. <laughs> yeah, and then they start betting on the fight as all these gnomes just beat the crap out of Owen. Oh, I love that scene. It, it, it is. It's it's one of my favorite <laughs> scenes, too. I lived in Birmingham, so I, I, I know the neighborhood. And, and, and you really, you know... E- I think one of the reasons why it works so well is that you take what, in other hands, could just be very silly, and you turn it into something real. Um, and one of those real things is that big guys can get taken down by a bunch of little guys. And that's... Yeah, that, I've experienced that myself in real life. <laughs> have, have you? Ah, well, that, 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 that may be yeah. one of the reasons why it feels real. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got my butt kicked by smaller people. If there's enough of them, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm not sure if we should ask you to go into that on uh, on uh, on the the radio here. Um, is that is that an experience oh, no, you can talk about? Oh, is well passed. Oh, okay, good. All right. 
Uh, no, I got beat up one time in high school. It was uh, uh, I was wrong place, wrong time, innocent bystander, and it was uh, it was a gang initiation thing for the local Nortino gang, and uh, they were just supposed to pick out like the biggest guy they could and just kick the crap out of him. And there was four of them and one of me, and I didn't see it coming, and they sucker punched me, and then it was just on. And uh, I actually still I still won, um, but it was not pretty. <laughs> And uh, I, I dislocated my jaw. I broke my nose. Uh, I got pretty beat up. But uh, well, I, I still won. In, so in the end, it worked out. I read in your biography that, <laughs> yeah, that they didn't realize they were messing with a dairy farmer's son who had uh, been throwing hay well, bales. I and... mean, all I did was move hay bales every day. <laughs> you don't want to pick a fight with a kid who pushes cows. Pick the wrong guy. <laughs> That's all you do. And it's like no matter how hard they hit you, you've been hit harder by a cow. <laughs> you seem like you've had some experience in the South. Say so you love the South. Um, what what was that? Did you ha- did you know know the South from something other than research? Uh, when you when you were writing the first well, two I books, lived in I lived in Alabama and Mississippi, and uh, I, I loved it down there. I enjoyed it. I lived there for a couple years. Um, the the thing is, when I started writing, I figured that um, Southerners get kind of a bad rap. And, uh, I mean, cause I really like, I'm, I'm a Westerner. I, you know, I grew up in California, a very rural part of California. And, um, I always kind of feel like Southerners get a bad rap in fiction. They're almost always this portrayed as dumb rednecks or, or just, you know, racist bumpkins or uneducated hicks. And that's not the South. I mean, if anybody who's lived in the South know that Southerners are cool. I mean, they're, they're really normal people. And then, if you work with like the military and stuff, you know, half the military has a southern accent. I mean, and they're tough. They're sharp. They're smart. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to have courageous southerners and I wanted to have tough, smart southerners. So I set, uh, I set Monster Hunter. I, I put the company headquarters for MHI in, uh, in Alabama and I made the, the founding family be, uh, you know, long-term Alabamans. And, uh, you know, I, I, so people, People really like it, especially people from the South. They're like, heck yeah. For yeah. so once, we're not a bunch of, you know, hicks and morons. That's right. We're courageous and tough. Oh, I still stuck in the trailer park, Ellis, <laughs> for everybody who has lived in the South, because we've all seen those people, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I just, I mean, um, just seeing DeSoto Caverns, which you have uh, disguised artfully as DeSoyo Caverns in the, uh, in the book. Uh, I grew up like 20 miles from there, so it's just wonderful to just see it in a book, you know, some place that I was so familiar with. So, uh, well, yeah, and I, I changed it from, uh, from uh, I changed it from Happy Hernando to Friendly, for, for friendly Fernando. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to get in trouble with the trade. Yeah, with my... yeah. <laughs> well, when I wrote it, I didn't know how that worked with you know, writers like, mm, can they sue you for this? I don't know. I better, I better change. I better change it a little bit just in case. <laughs> yeah. Never hurts. A little discretion never hurts. It's totally not Desoto Caverns. So. <laughs> so. Totally not. Totally not. Well, there, there is one. It's a giant there's... cave system discovered by a conquistador in eastern Alabama. <laughs> well, there, there is one key difference. So. <laughs> The, the monsters. The monsters, oh, yes. I don't know. I, 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 I camped out in those caves, and I'm not sure they don't have monsters. In. Uh, yeah, I, I, took a, I took a tour of them one time, and I was, they were just, and years before, it was so creepy. And then I needed, a, I needed a place to set the finale of the book, and I was like, that was such an awesome place. It, was just, it just cried out for um, it cried out for a giant monster fight. I mean, pretty much everywhere I go, everywhere I travel, I'm looking for places to set giant monster fights. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the fam- the the, fam- the family yeah, road trip was uh, was really a research trip, wasn't it? Well, yeah, like uh, like uh, Monster Hunter Legion, we trash Las Vegas, and uh, you know I've been to Las Vegas a lot over the years for trade shows and business and that kind of thing. So I love trashing Las Vegas. Um, in um, Spellbound, I trash Washington D.C. I trash the mall with a giant monster fight, and um, love that because um, you know it's this big historical place lots of people have been there big tourist attraction and uh and so people are familiar with it so when they read the scene and you actually do the research and you get everything in the right place as people read through it they can kind of imagine themselves or they can imagine the fight scene better because they're familiar with it 
So, and plus, I just like destroying national landmarks and national treasures. <laughs> in Monster Hunter Legion, you you do trash Las Vegas. Um, something something nasty gets dig, dug up in the nearby uh, Nevada desert. I don't want to. We don't want to give too much away. But there's a there's a nasty World War II experiment that's gone awry as part of the Legion story that makes for a very cool monster. Did you do some historical research on uh, on government experiments that, and kind of monsterize them, or is this just something that that burst from the Korea imagination whole cloth? I actually, kind of kind of interested. Two parts on that. Um, uh, I worked as a military contractor for a long time, and one of the contracts that we had was um, at Dugway, uh, Dugway, Utah. Which, for those not familiar with Dugway, Dugway is where the U.S. military has buried every horrible thing ever. Um, like every chemical weapon we've ever experimented on, every biological weapon we've ever experimented on, it is all buried at Dugway. And it is a big, big, I mean, it's bigger than Rhode Island, giant, scary base uh, with all sorts of weird secret stuff out there. And so it's kind of like conspiracy theorists love Dugway. And, uh, and I thought it was just a fascinating place I figured if the U.S. government ever did experiment with monsters and they had remains, they would bury them in Dugway. <laughs> That's the place to go. And then it does kind of tie in with some stuff that happened in World War II um, in that, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not to give any plot stuff away, but, um, uh, you know, FDR rounded up Japanese Americans and shoved them all into concentration camps. And I've actually had that come into play in two books now, in two separate series, because I used to live in uh, Delta, Utah. And uh, we lived about a mile from um, the old Topaz concentration camp, which is like the most windswept, freezing cold, godforsaken bit of desert you can imagine. I mean, it is just the nastiest, coldest, ugliest place ever. And, uh, you know, when we were young, we used to, when I was in high school, we used to go out and we would, uh, we would hunt rabbits out there. And, and you just get out to this middle of this place, it's just, horrible place and you would imagine that they just took these people and stuck them out here in shacks and uh and so that's always kind of stuck with me and so that's why i've had that show up in a in a few books uh, uh now and um I, I don't know so i guess everywhere i go i'm always looking for stuff that can wind up in books i guess i'm i'm very regional yeah. Was that was that hotel uh, a particular hotel that uh, in in Vegas? A uh, combination of a couple that I've stayed in, but once again, I didn't want to have it be a real one, um, so they wouldn't get mad at me. <laughs> oh, and like uh, you'll notice, one of the hotels is uh, is named Diamond Steve's. Mm -hmm. That's because uh, Steve Diamond was my assistant uh, and my military contractor job, and my replacement when I left. And, uh, so, and I was writing the book at the time, and he's a book reviewer on the, uh, he runs his book reviews, uh, he's Hugo nominated now, uh, Hot Shot. And, uh, so that's why I had the casino was Diamond Steeds. Cause, you know, I, when I needed to destroy a, blow up a bunch of casinos, man, I needed to come up with names, and, uh, I've, I've killed, I saw I've killed Steve in a book, and I have also blown up his casino. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, yeah, names and places, nothing is safe. Uh, nothing is safe for for me. Well, let me let me get serious with you just for a bit. Um, I I know that you you um, make you're you're sort of proud of being a straight on pulp writer, but you yeah, and you absolutely tend to keep religion and politics out of your stuff in general. But there's a real sense of of good and evil that I think really is appealing, and in the Monster Hunter series in particular, the heroes have their issues, but they're good guys. The monsters are really really evil. Um, one even maybe gets the sense you're trying to make a point about this, uh, and it's hard to do. In yeah, I, 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 I do. I, I am a firm believer. I, I really, really believe in that there is real good and evil in the world, and I think people need to uh, people need to basically pick a side and not be mushy. And uh, I, uh, I, I try, I, I try to have good guys that you can really root for. And, you know, it's like you said, they're human, they're flawed, they make mistakes, they make bad calls, but they're trying to be good, and they are honestly good guys. And then I've had, I try to have villains that, yeah, they've got their motivations and they've got their reasons, but they're bad guys and they're evil. And that way when you blow them up, um, 
the audience loves it. I don't like to get into the whole, you know, mushy, oh, we're all the same. It's just a different, they just have a different philosophy. Ah, you know, that's bullcrap, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to have actual good versus actual evil. I think, I think people like having that in their fiction. Um, I think, I think people, I think, I think writers tend to like over nuance stuff and we tend to over complicate things. Sometimes you just need a straight up good versus evil story and you want the good guys to just punch evil in the face. You know? I, I, and so I, 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 I try to do that. I, 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 agree, um, I agree with you entirely. I, but the, the, I do have some politics in there. The politics do sneak in. Um, you know, all my good guys are heavily armed. <laughs> I mean, Monster Hunter is probably not as political as uh, as Grim Noir. Grim Noir, I tend to stick a little more politics in there, you know. But mostly that's because it's dealing with with issues that 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 you know they're they're real life political issues. But um, but I try not to get too heavy handed with it because I don't I don't like when books cram stuff down your throat. I, I I agree with you there. I, th- I think uh, getting back to your point about about good and evil, um, it it sounds very simple and it sounds um, easy to do. But in fact, uh, I have found that it is very hard um, to find writers who are capable of uh, doing uh, what you do um, and of making that distinction and of, of and of and of evoking it um, in the reader. So uh, let let me let me take my hat off to you on that. It's. Uh, um, it's it, it's sort of like John Wayne's acting. Um, it looks like he's not acting until you actually start studying it, um, and then you see how very tricky it is to do what it is that he does. Yeah, see, I think John Wayne gets a bad rap. I think John Wayne was awesome. Oh, I agree. With you. <laughs> sure. he, he, yeah, he totally. I mean, he totally channeled that. Um, Quiet man's you know, most favorite. Straightforward man. American badass. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about what's next. Uh, you pulled the trigger in Monster Hunter Legion on Owen being Owen uh, Pitt being the chosen one, destined to be part of some kind of Monster Ragnarok. I, I it seems like is that where we're going in the next Monster Hunter book? Well, I am leading up to basically Monster Apocalypse. Um, uh, the next Monster Hunter book will will build more towards that on the overall arc. But um, the next one is is, uh, is stepping back again from the main character, and it's going to be about a secondary character, kind of like Monster Hunter Alpha was about Earl Harbinger. The next Monster Hunter novel is Monster Hunter Nemesis, and it's about Agent Franks. Um, and so it's it's just like Alpha in that it takes place in the same timeline, except it's got a lot of information about where Franks came from, and uh, and who Franks really is. Uh, and then it, it the kind of it, it, the joke is it's subtitled, it's Monster Hunter Nemesis colon Agent Franks versus the World. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh my gosh, it's fun. It's uh, I, I've just barely started it. I mean, but I've, I've got it's all outlined in. Uh, no, I mean, I've been working on the notes for a while. It's awesome, and it's just Agent Franks. Uh, not to give too much away, but the way Monster Hunter Region ends up. Um, Agent Franks is kind of, kind of in trouble. There's, um, there's been some problems. He's, he's kind of gone off the reservation a little bit, and it's all part of this big plot, um, to get Agent Franks, uh, no longer protected by the government. So Agent Franks becomes puff applicable. And so, and somebody's trying to get rid of him, so it's the biggest monster bounty in the history of the world. And so, uh, it's just fantastic. So it's, it's basically everybody, after Franks, while Franks is trying to solve a very difficult problem, but uh, cool. Well, Franks is <laughs> Franks is the one that horrible person. Yeah, <laughs> Franks is the one that, that Owen couldn't beat. Uh, he was the Fed that Owen just didn't have much of a, a chance against. Because oh of, yeah, and there's a, there's a great scene. Um, there's a great scene where Monster Hunter uh, gets uh, basically this uh, this message that that Agent Franks is now you know to kill Agent Franks is worth like a hundred million dollars. And um, they get this, and they're looking at it, and, and they're all just kind of stone-faced looking at each other around the conference table, all the Monster Hunters. And uh, somebody goes, or Holly, Holly goes, wow, that is a lot of money. And Owen says, yeah, but we can't spend it if we're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Ah, uh, the voice of reason, yes. <laughs> because Owen, Owen, more than anybody, uh, has seen Franks in action. And uh, Franks is just so incredibly relentless and uh, indestructible and smart, too. He's smarter than you give him credit for because he's clever. He's cunning. And um, so it's, it's awesome. So it's basically Agent Franks versus a secret government agency that then brings in every monster hunter in the world to try to kill Agent Franks. And uh, it's fantastic. Very um, cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. But a bunch of a bunch of pre- a bunch of previously introduced characters come back. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think people are really gonna. I think people are really gonna enjoy it. Well, Frank's dropped some hints in Legion of uh, as to his origins, including when he came over to America, which was really really great. <laughs> So I know, I don't want to give that away too much. No, yeah, no. oh my gosh. That sequence is so fun to write. But you can get Owen's prepared so for it. He's, well, I mean, I, I, I guess I can do some spoilers. You know, spoiler alert here if you haven't read Legion yet. But um, Agent Franks was a Hessian. Um, <laughs> I mean, he came over with the Germans and fought the Colonials and basically got, got, offered, a, got offered a deal by Benjamin Franklin. You know, George Washington wanted to burn Agent Franks as an abomination. <laughs> oh man, I love him so much. He's such a fun guy. Well, he's he's a very he's a very ambiguous. Challenging to write a book of. Yeah, I was just okay, about to say. Funny? I was just about to say he's a very ambiguous character, I and mean, we're not sure whether we hate him or, or 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 what side he's on. You know, talking about picking a side. So writing a whole novel from from his point point of view should be uh, an interesting challenge. Yeah, it's been it's been kind of kind of fun because he's he's kind of monosyllabic. I mean, he doesn't talk much. Um, okay, like Owen. Owen is a fantastic first person point of view narrator because he's funny and he's sarcastic. And, and he's wordy. I mean, he's a, he's actually a, he's a thinking kind of guy. So it's great to narrate from his perspective. And, uh, Frank's, Frank's is just like, this happened. <laughs> mm. So, uh, it's written in the third person, um, uh, like Monster Hunter Alpha was. Yep. Just because, uh, you can't do a whole book, you can't do a whole book just from the perspective of, of Frank's. Um, you gotta bounce around a little bit. To, to, to mix it up. Um, I do, you know, just like the elves and the gnomes and the trolls and the minotaurs and the dragons, I do try to introduce another, you know, take on a traditional monster. Um, there's actually a, there's actually a, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and give a spoiler for something that's not written yet, but there's actually a succubus in, uh, in Monster Hunter Nemesis. Because somebody's asking, like, well, how could Franks, how could Franks have a love interest? It's not like Franks has love. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, as a challenge, I was trying to come up with a way to do it. So, so we introduced I have the succubus with benefits. Um, <laughs> oh, we're gonna have we're we're, we're gonna have a good time with that cover. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah, oh, man. Classic, I'm trying, uh, I imagine Alan Pollock's probably gonna be like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I can he, see he Tony's rubbing her hands together with. right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alan is so good at that. I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Pollock is the uh, is the guy that does most uh, all the Monster Hunter covers, hasn't he? Yeah. So that was Alan Pollock. Who... Yeah, he's he's done all the Monster Hunter covers, and he's just done he's done an awesome job. They, they've been awesome. So uh, we're talking about uh, Larry Correa's next book is going to be Monster Hunter Nemesis, but uh, Nemesis, but this one uh, that is now out is Monster Hunter Legion. That's the book. It's now in mass market paperback. And at booksellers everywhere. Larry also has Warbound, book three in the Grim Noir Chronicles, coming up in hardcover. I hope to talk to you about that in a month or so. As well as the sequel to Dead Six, Swords of Exodus, out in the fall. So, Larry, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thanks, guys. I had a great time. And thank you, Tony, for sitting in. Hey, hey. Glad to be here. To round out our Larry Korea interview, we thought we'd bring you a song called The Monster Hunter Ballad by Gray Reinhardt. If Gray's name sounds familiar, that's because Gray is the Bane Slushmaster General, the first reader on unsolicited manuscripts submitted to Bane books. Gray is also a filker of some repute, 
a performer of music with science fiction lyrics. That's what that means. And this is from his upcoming album, Truth, Lies, and Make-Believe. The song has Larry Correa's stamp of high approval and is available as a single cut at bandcamp.com. The link to that is in the podcast forum at the Baines Bar. You can get there from the podcast page at bang.com. Here is the podcast debut of The Monster Hunter Ballad. They say that what you don't know, it won't hurt you. But everything they tell you is a lie Jethro Tull had it right There are beasties in the night Better keep a loaded weapon by your side Don't you worry, little darling Monster hunters on the call Protecting you while you sleep safe and sound We've got the bounty on the beasties And the good lord on our side Anytime the scary monsters come around, we'll put them down. I believe the best vampire is a dead one. And most werewolves aren't all that civilized. I sure don't want one of them dating my daughter. You know, they only sparkle when they're on fire. Don't be afraid now, little darling Monster hunters on the case Against everything that goes bump in the night Lock your doors and draw the shades And keep your weapon close at hand We'll do everything to get to you in time And you'll be fine When the monster's at the door Well, you can run or you can fight you can call on 911 for your protection. The boys in blue won't be as much help as your trusty little friend, Samuel Colt, or Clock, or good old Smith and Wesson. Hold your ground now, little darling, monster hunters on the way. Stand and fight, and this may be your finest hour. Whatever monsters got you cornered, we will fight them one or all. We'll keep the peace. Through superior firepower, Second Amendment firepower. Queen of Elves lives in a trailer in the middle of the woods, drinking beer and eating ho hos by the score. The orcs all like to party, you see, they're just misunderstood. There are friends and allies in the monster war, so don't you worry. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has defeated one long-standing enemy, the Havenites, and reached a truce with another menace, the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and rebellion is brewing. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka 
Countess Goldpeak, is in command of Royal Manticoran naval forces in the Talbot Quadrant, where the Sollies butt up against the systems of Manticoran allies. Goldpeak sympathizes with the rebels, but she is also wary of a conspiracy by the shadowy Mason alignment to set Manticore and the Sollies at one another's throats. Goldpeak wants the help she can provide to those throwing off the Sali yoke to be effective. Now in the Saltash system, that chance may have arrived. With the help of Salarian battle cruisers, the governor of the system has impounded Manticoran merchant ships in a deliberate act of provocation and greed. But in the system now is Commodore Jacob Zavala, commander of a destroyer squadron led by the HMS Tristram. Zavala has shown that he is quite prepared to call the governor's bluff and to use force if necessary. Here is part 16 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. They are coming out to meet us, ma'am, Abigail Hearns announced three minutes later as the battle cruiser's nodes went fully online and a quartet of impeller wedges appeared on the tactical display and began moving away from their original position between Shona Station and Desron 301. I see them, guns. Naomi Kaplan replied almost absently, but Abigail knew that tone of voice. Tristram's CO was putting on her warrior's face, settling into predator mode while her brain whirred like another computer. We'll just have to see how serious they are about this, I suppose. Kaplan added a moment later, and her smile was hungry. For Desron 301, and especially for HMS Tristram, the Star Empire of Manticore's confrontation with the Solarian League was personal. Very personal. That was as true for Abigail as for anyone else in the ship's company, and she found herself wondering if that was one of the reasons Lady Goldpeak had picked Captain Zavala's squadron for this operation in the first place. Vice Admiral Dubrovskaya's battlecruisers accelerated towards the oncoming Manticoran destroyers at 3.89 kps squared. 80% of their maximum theoretical rate of acceleration. There was no particular hurry, and even at that low excel, they'd move over four million kilometers closer to the Mantis before Zavala's 27-minute time limit expired. Of course, during that same time, the Mantis would move 42 million kilometers closer to Cinnamon. The range between the two forces would be down to only 36,700,000 kilometers at that point, and the closing speed between them would give the Solarians' Javelin anti-ship missiles an effective powered envelope at launch of better than 12 million kilometers. Dubrovskaya was more willing than Kelvin Diodoro to admit that the Mantis' tube-launched missiles might have more range than hers, but nothing the size of a light cruiser could stow internally was going to have a lot more, she thought, as she watched her ship's icons moving across the display. For that matter, assuming constant accelerations on both sides— it would require only an additional fifteen and a half minutes for her to reach her own powered range of the Mantis. Two of her ships, Success and Paladin, were Flight 5 Indefatigables, with the old SL-11B launcher, with a 45-second launch cycle, but Vanquisher and Inexorable had the newer SL-13 launcher, with a cycle time of only 35 seconds, and the Mantis could probably do a bit better than that. Solarian destroyers and light cruisers certainly could have, given the smaller and lighter missiles with which they were armed, but any internally launched missile with enough range to threaten her squadron at this kind of range was going to have to be at least as large as her own javelins. That was bound to slow their rate of fire, so call it 30 seconds for the other side's launch cycle. That meant they'd have time for roughly 31 broadsides before she could range on them, but with no more than 8 to 10 tubes per broadside, that would be only 310 missiles maximum per platform, delivered in combined salvos of no more than 50 each. And as Diodoro had pointed out, at least some of those missiles were going to have to be configured as penetration aids and electronic warfare platforms. Her four battlecruisers mounted eight countermissile tubes and 16 point defense stations in each broadside, which gave the squadron 32 CMs and 64 laser clusters against a probable threat of no more than 40 ship killers per launch. She smiled coldly, contemplating the plot. No cruiser-sized missile ever built was going to get through that strong a defense in sufficient numbers to stop her before she was able to bring her own tubes into action, and her ships mounted 28 of them in each broadside. 
Once she got into range, she'd be firing salvos of 116 missiles each, at which point her heavier javelins would reduce the mantis to drifting wreckage in quick order. They don't seem to be very impressed, sir, George Auerbach observed quietly, and Jacob Zavala nodded. It's been my observation that the best way to impress a Soli is to shoot him squarely between the eyes, he told his chief of staff, never looking away from the plot. You wouldn't want to shoot him anywhere else, though. You might hurt him. Auerbach winced slightly at his CO's idea of humor, but he couldn't deny that Zavala had a point. Still, he was the squadron's chief of staff, which gave him certain responsibilities. We'll be coming up on Point Alpha in about ten minutes, sir. Are you sure you want to go with Sledgehammer? Doing your job again, I see, George, Zavala said, turning away from the tactical display to smile briefly at Auerbach. Yes, you say, sir, it is my job. I know, George, I know. Zavala reached up to put his hand on the taller Auerbach shoulder and squeezed gently. And, he admitted to himself, the chief of staff had a point. No one in Desron 301 had been particularly happy with Fire Plan Zephyr, the alternative to Sledgehammer, yet he had to concede that it would be more elegant and might, might reduce the severity of the incident which was about to occur here in Saltash. The problem was that it would also be riskier and far less personally satisfying. I wonder how honest I've been with myself about this, Zavala thought. It would be riskier, but how much have I allowed that satisfaction quotient to color my thinking? He made himself stand back and consider the alternatives one more time. Zephyr would be more in the way of a demonstration of the consequences of unreasonableness than a serious attack. A concentrated salvo of Mark 16s fired from far beyond the Sollies' effective range to penetrate their defenses without hitting anything, much as Duchess Harrington had done to the Havenite's second fleet with Apollo at First Manticore, and Captain Ivanov had done more recently in Zunker. In theory, a reasonable Solarian commander would realize most of his ships would be pounded into ruin in the fifteen or sixteen minutes it would take him to get into his own range of Zavala's squadron, at which point— the hypothetical reasonable Solarian commander would conclude he had no alternative but to stand down after all. There was, however, a minor weakness in that logic. It presupposed a reasonable Solarian commander. There had been precious few of those in evidence since Joseph Bing had come upon the scene. Worse, if the commander on the other side refused to take the hint, Zavala would have wasted one of his salvos for no return, and a Roland's limited magazine space was its Achilles heel. With only twenty rounds for each of his tubes, he couldn't afford to waste ammunition. And still worse, even a Sali who wasn't totally unreasonable might decide he could survive whatever Desron 301 could throw at him for fifteen minutes and still get to grips with the destroyers. Zavala didn't think Dabroskaya could, but his analysis of the only engagement between a Mark 16 armed force and Solarian designed battlecruisers suggested that they might. Of course, Ivar's Terakov had been equipped with the first-generation Mark 16 at the Battle of Monica, whereas Desron 301's birds mounted the latest Mod G laser heads. That probably changed the equation considerably, but there was no way for Zavala to know that. Either way, given their closing velocity, the Sollies were going to overfly his own ships before they could decelerate, and any of the battle cruisers which survived the crossing might well escape into hyper after all. Zavala doubted any of them would survive, and even if they did get into their own missile range of Desron 301 before they were knocked out, a Roland-class destroyer's missile defenses were actually considerably tougher than an indefatigable's, given the superiority of Manticore's counter-missiles, decoys, and ECM. But his destroyers were no better armored than any other destroyer or light cruiser. If Zavala was wrong about his defense's ability to fend off incoming missiles, and if the Sollies got lucky, it wouldn't take very many javelin hits to ruin a Roland's entire day. Besides, he thought grimly, we don't owe these bastards a frigging thing, and I'm damned if I'm going to put my people at risk trying to keep the arrogant pricks from getting themselves killed. 
It was possible, he conceded, that he wasn't cut from the right material for a successful diplomat. On the other hand, Countess Goldpeak had known that when she sent him out. I've thought about it, George, he said. I really have. But, no, we're not going with Zephyr. Yes, sir. Commander Auerbach gazed into the display for a second or two, then shrugged. Actually, sir, I'm fine with that, he said. Come request from the Mantis, ma'am, Commander Gervasio Urbanovich said. Vice Admiral Dabrowskaya glanced at him, and the communications officer shrugged. It's that Captain Zavala, ma'am, and I think his signal is being relayed by whatever he used to speak to the Governor FTL. It's a standard comm laser coming from some kind of platform just ahead of us, at any rate. Dabrowskaya glanced at Captain Kiernan. Interesting timing, ma'am, Kiernan said. Maybe McGillicuddy was on to something after all. I suppose we're about to find out, Dabrowskaya said and nodded to Urbanovich. Put it on the main display, Gervasio. Yes, ma'am. The same officer whose image Governor Duenas had relayed to Dabrowskaya appeared on the master communications display. He looked out of it for a moment, then his eyes narrowed as he saw her image. It had taken less than two seconds for him to react, even though they were still better than two light minutes apart, but at least she'd had enough forewarning to keep her unhappiness at that proof of his FTL capabilities from reaching her eyes or her expression. I am Vice Admiral Oksana Dubrovskaya, Solarian League Navy, she said coldly. What can I do for you, Captain Zavala? You might consider standing down and abandoning ship in the next two minutes or so, Admiral Dabrowskaya, he replied, and an icy centipede seemed to sidle along her spine as his unflinching eyes and level tone registered. If this was a man who'd just discovered his bluff had failed, he was one hell of a poker player. And what makes you think I might be interested in doing that, Captain? she asked. I believe Governor Duenas has made the Solarian League's position abundantly clear. If, however, you'd care to surrender your vessels before I turn them into a drifting debris field, feel free. You know, Zavala said coldly, I'm perpetually astonished by Solarian arrogance. My recon platforms picked up your battlecruisers less than 45 minutes after my Alpha translation, Admiral. That's how long they've been all over you and I knew not just where you were, but what you were, better than a half hour before I made turnover, and I've got over two hundred gravities of Excel in reserve. Think about that. If I'd been worried about what you might do to me, I could have been all the way back across the hyperlimit and headed home before I even spoke to Governor Duenas. The centipede seemed to have invited its entire family to keep it company, Nebraskaya reflected. That's a bold statement, Captain she heard her own voice say. You'll forgive me if I point out that I have only your word for your remarkable acceleration rate and the amazing capabilities and supernatural stealthiness of those recon drones of yours. Personally, I find things like the Tooth Fairy a bit difficult to believe in. So, should I assume from your skepticism that you think you've managed to track my actual recon platforms? You know exactly where each of them is? Probably not all of them, Dabrowskaya admitted. In fact, they'd managed to localize no more than a dozen of them, and all of those had remained beyond effective engagement range from her battlecruisers. She'd used up twenty or thirty missiles before she'd accepted that, but they were devilishly elusive targets, and they kept disappearing back into stealth and zipping away from their plotted positions before her missiles could get there. She felt confident the Mantis would have deployed more than that, and her sensor sections had been picking up backscatter from grav pulses, which might represent additional platforms, or have something to do with the Mantis' obvious ability to transmit broadband data at faster-than-light speeds. Still, there couldn't be a lot more of them without her people having picked them up. Your stealth systems obviously are better than we'd expected, but I imagine we've located the majority of them at least approximately she continued, her tone only slightly more confident than she actually felt. Then watch your plot, Admiral, 
Zavala invited in that same cold voice, and Dabrowskaya heard Diodoro inhale sharply. Her eyes darted to the main plot as CIC updated it, and an entire globe of icons, thirty of them at least, appeared around her battlecruisers, keeping pace with them effortlessly at ranges as low as a light second and a half as they dropped their stealth. They glittered there, taunting her with their proximity for at least ten seconds. Then, before her startled fire control officers could lock them up, they vanished mockingly once more. She had no doubt they were all busily streaking away to completely different positions from which to keep her under observation from within their protective cloak of invisibility. Admiral Dabrowskaya, I can read the names on your ship's hulls from here, Zavala told her as the dusting of icons disappeared from her plot once again. And I still haven't shown you all of my platforms. I warn you once again that I knew exactly what your battlecruisers were before I contacted Duenas, and I have real-time data on every move you make. You can abandon ship now and save a lot of lives, or what's left of your people can abandon what's left of your ships when I'm done with them. And if you think for one moment that I'll hesitate to pull the trigger, Admiral, you just reflect that the ships of Joseph Bing slaughtered at New Tuscany came from this destroyer squadron. I'm giving you a chance to save your people's lives, which is a hell of a lot more than he gave Commodore Chatterjee or any of our other shipmates. But that's as far as the ship goes, Admiral, and you now have 75 seconds to tell me you're going to abandon. They locked eyes, and despite her best effort, Dabrowskaya couldn't convince herself he was bluffing. He might be wrong. In fact, he probably was, but he wasn't bluffing. If she didn't accept his terms he would open a fire as soon as he was in range. But she couldn't. She simply couldn't surrender four battlecruisers to only five light cruisers. She couldn't, and not just because of Duaneus's orders. Maybe the stories about New Tuscany, even the wild rumors coming out of Spindle, were true after all. But if they were, that only made it even more imperative that the Navy draw a line somewhere, stop the chain of humiliations, and reclaim its honor. And I will be damned before I let this arrogant little prick of a captain dictate terms to me, by God, she thought harshly. No, not this time, Captain Zavala. Captain Diodoro. She never took her eyes from Zavala's face and raised her voice enough to be sure the Manticoran could hear her. Yes, ma'am? We will maintain this course and acceleration. Prepare to engage the enemy, Vice Admiral Oksana Dubrovskaya said and cut the calm connection. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 16, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Hank Davis, and March to the Stars theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Old God Destroying Nuclear Detonations of Thanks and Gratitude to Larry Correa and to Gray Reinhardt. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. 